All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Machine Organization and Programming. This is lecture 18. This is the one that was supposed to come out on Tuesday, but I've got to admit, I've fallen a little bit behind. Uh, there's no camera again today. I got the little guy sitting there behind me. Looks like he's playing some Wolfenstein. I'm curious, if you guys can hear him clicking on the keyboard, somebody post in the comments. I just need one. And uh, then I can kick him out of the room while I do my recording, if it's a problem. All right, uh, yeah, the last two days have had really a lot of stuff going on for me. The big one was that after I released the solutions to the midterm, I've gotten almost 40 requests, it's just under that, uh, for students who wanted me to review uh, one or more of the questions on the exam. Um, there's 80 people in class, that's half the class. I've still got about, uh, I just counted a little bit ago, about 18 more to go, um, and I'm gonna just put that on hold. I'll review them this weekend. Uh, so if you're waiting, uh, thank you for your patience. I did get back to uh, about half of the people who have requested uh, that I look at something and most of those were uh, real concerns So I'm using the canvas auto grader for a lot of the questions where you guys had to type in uh, It's a fill-in-the-blank type question and if your answer didn't match exactly uh, Like if you had an extra space in the, in the answer um, The canvas auto grader uh, took that as two words instead of one one word with the or if you misspelled something, just a minor typo or whatever, but demonstrated you understood what was going on. I'm taking all those. I'm taking a look at them. Um, so, uh, but thank you for your patience while I do that. It's uh, more time consuming than I imagined. Okay, a couple of other announcements. Um, P3 is uh, due on Tuesday. Uh, let's see. This is going to be a shorter video. Um, but there's going to be a substantial like self-guided learning component to it. If you guys skip that, you're missing out on the point. I, I want to provide like a framework and an opportunity to go through and make sure that you guys really know what's going on, that you've nailed down at least the three important fundamentals before we jump into uh, function calls and assembly. And those three are uh, the condition code register, that hidden register that keeps track of the result of every computation, the jump decision-making process, so the jump commands take advantage of those condition codes, but it's all kind of under the hood, hidden from us, even as an assembly programmer. But it's going on. We have access to that stuff. Um, and then finally, loops. So those are the things I'm really going to focus on today that you really need to know. And then a couple of other uh, topics just to fill out today's lecture so that I wrap up everything before we jump into functions so it's all in one place, so that functions are separate. Um, yep. All right, so conditional jumps, the loops, uh, we're going to be taking a look at some C code and turning it into assembly and walking through it. And then uh, the last two things, uh, stack pointer, essential for function calls, and the load effective address command. So I just want to start off with uh, a review problem to kind of walk through and introduce the idea of conditional jumping and talk a little bit about what needs to go on here when we convert a program like this to assembly. So I've just got something very simple right here. Uh, I've got, I'm declaring two variables, an A and a B. I'm going to compare them. If A is greater than or equal to B, then I'm going to do what's in these statements right here. And if not, then I'm going to skip it. So let's talk about what happens when we turn this into assembly. Uh, first, I need to store the values of A and B somewhere. I'm going to pick the A -E -E -A -X and the EBX register. The dollar sign means I'm storing an immediate value in them. So now I've got my, my two pieces of data in registers. Now when I look at this condition, um, the if statement right here, I need to evaluate an expression so I can set all of those condition code registers, those flags. Um, and the way we do that is with the compare, uh, compare long, L for long. And remember, I need to reverse these. So if I've got B over here on the right, A on the left, this is really computing a subtraction problem, A minus B, where my source is gonna be the B register, uh, destination is gonna be A. This doesn't actually get stored anywhere, so uh, it computes A minus B. But what this does too, compare just sets a bunch of flags. These are signed numbers. I'm, I'm using uh, just regular int here. So the only ones I care about are the signed flag, the overflow flag, and the zero flag. There's a carry flag also. We don't care about that one for signed numbers. Okay, and once I've got uh, the uh, results of this computation, that's enough to make a decision about whether I wanna uh, do these statements or not. So the, the uh, command I need is actually the jump less than. So look at it this way. It's again, this is one of those places where things are reversed. Because in C, if I'm writing statement like if greater than or equal to B, then I want to do these. In assembly, I'm going to be skipping instead of doing. So I'm going to jump over them. So I need the reverse of this. I need if A is less than B, then skip down. I also need labels so like because I'm doing jump commands. Um, 
So I, I put my label here. I've got L2. The colon in C is a way that we can say that this is a label. And I'm using my jump less than for L2. So the question I want to ask now is what flags really got set right here? And what are the conditions? What flags need to be set for um, this jump to be executed? All right, I, I, I'm pretty sure I went over a lot of this, maybe a little quickly in the last lecture. And I want to just dive in on one problem and just make sure that this is absolutely rock solid. So if we take a look at this specific example, we turn these numbers into binary and do the actual math. So I've got a is equal to 1. I'm computing a minus b. So 0, 0, 1. Uh, b is 2. That's 0, 1, 0. And I subtract in binary. So 1 take away 0 is 1. 0 take away 1. Okay, here I need to borrow. So I'm going to be borrowing from this fourth bit. Uh, imaginary number not really there. And that's going to say that I've got a... Well, 2, 0, and then I'm going to borrow from the 2 that's now imaginary, make a 1, 2. And so 2 take away 1 is 1. 1 take away 0 is 1. And I end up with negative 1 as my answer. Okay, and that's perfect. That makes sense. We're using sign numbers. 1 take away 2 is negative 1. So the things I care about, um, first up, the result is negative. So that's going to set the sign flag. And when we set something, that's going to give it a value of 1. Okay, the next thing I, I did borrow... Uh, we did borrow, but that's not important for sign math. That would set the carry flag. We don't care about that one. So I'm just going to like not even write about it. We're moving on. Okay, the next thing we need to look for is overflow. And this is when, this is that more complicated uh, idea, um, condition. So if A is negative and I subtract something from it that's positive, I need to get a negative number. Otherwise, I've seen that it overflowed, basically wrapped around my number line ended up as the positive side of things. So in this case, um, the result is in fact negative instead of positive, so no overflow occurred. So the overflow flag will be set to zero. All right, after that, uh, the condition that we were looking for to jump, I guess it makes a lot of sense that the sign flag need, would be one, is one of the possibilities. So in this case, anytime I take a number and subtract a bigger number from it, if we have unlimited numbers available to us, if the number line is not restricted by the number of bits we get, we're going to get a negative number. Okay, so it makes sense that the sign flag equal one is that's perfect. Um, but the fact is, in a computer system, we're limited to the number of bits that we're able to use to store data, and that restricts the you know the, the smallest negative number and the largest positive number we can get. And so, if we do a subtraction, that would end up you know. If A is in fact less than B, I do the subtraction. It's possible to get a number that doesn't fit in that number range. And the math is going to work. It's not going to give us an error. It's just going to sort of wrap around and end up with a positive number. So I need to look for either this or if there's overflow. So either one of those is a condition that says, yes, A was actually less than B. Okay, so, a, but it can't be both of them. We need one or the other. So that's this exclusive or one or the other. So in this case, for this example, one take away two, one is less than two. So I get a true in the end. That means take this jump. So in this case, I would have skipped these statements in my if uh, condition block, or my if block right here, and gone straight on to L2. All right, I want to take a look at another example that also should skip it. If a is minus four, that's certainly less than three. But with three bit integers, this is going to lead to the overflow problem I was just trying to describe. And hopefully an explicit example will make this clear. So in this case, we're doing, yep, oh, here, let me do the math. So negative four is one, zero, zero. I'm subtracting three from it. So three is zero, one, one. So zero take away one is one. Zero take away one is one. Zero take, oh, hold, hold, hold on, Micro's growing up. Okay, so zero take away one means I need to borrow. So I'm going to take this one right here, turn it into a two in the next digit over, then borrow from that. So I have one, or zero, one, two, after I do this borrowing. Two take away one is one. One take away one is zero. And I've borrowed from here, so zero take away zero is zero. So at the end, I get one. Um, this subtraction did not work out. But what we need to know is, we don't care what the result of subtraction is, we're not saving this. We just need to know if A is less than B. Okay, so if the result is positive, um, in this case, the sign flag is equal to zero. Okay, if we had unlimited access to numbers, if we had like a much bigger range, it would have come out to be negative seven, it would have been negative. But when we did this computation, that didn't work out because the 
because of the overflow issue. So the next thing I look at, um, the yes, it did overflow. So A is in fact less than zero. I subtracted something from it, something positive, and got a number that was positive. That can't possibly happen unless I've overflowed. So I've set the overflow flag to one here. And the, that jump condition is gonna be either the sign flagged or the overflow flag is um, set. So one or the other, not both, not neither. So this is in fact going to say, yes, we're gonna jump. A is less than B, A, so we skip all of the stuff in my if block right here. Okay, um, I personally found this to be really tricky to think about as I was going through this the first many times. So and that's part of why I'm spending a, a few more minutes of today's lecture, just making sure I get to review it for you guys. If you've nailed this, that's awesome. Um, I found it to be hard. So maybe here's another way to think about it. I like this number line logic with small numbers. I mean, these all fit here. So if I choose any number of all the possible choices and I'm looking and comparing it to any other number. So if I say, for example, have like negative two, is that less than zero? It is. But when I do that subtraction, I'm going to just take negative two and shift it zero positions to the left because I'm subtracting. Okay, so I end up at negative two, it's still negative. That tells me the sign conditions met and we saw no overflow, it didn't wrap around. If I take negative three and I subtract three from it, then I start with negative three, I'm gonna go left one, two, three places, and I wrapped around. So I know that negative three is less than three, so that should be true, but I no longer have that negative number. Instead, what I'm seeing is I'm getting positive two in this case. Did I count right? One, two, three, yep. Um, and so when I overflowed, um, that's gonna be the other condition that's gonna trigger this jump, be because I know that it's less than. Because I I would have had, let's see, what's a good way to say that? I would have had, if I had had more numbers available, it would have still been a negative number. But I didn't, and it wrapped around. So because of this condition, the overflow also means that this is going to be, um, trigger the less than condition. And so I'll skip these statements in that block. Okay, so if this were a live lecture in a real classroom, I would have everybody go grab a partner and take a look at this as a worksheet and just sort of walk through what flags need to be set what are the conditions before each of these jumps will execute and so what i've done here is i want this to be just sort of a guided learning opportunity uh, i've done the first one this is the one we just did it's well it's not the first one it's kind of in the middle um, but i think this one has enough complexity that if you grab this one the rest of these you should be able to work through on your own and so that's what i'd like you guys to do is just pause the video See how many of these you can get. The next couple of slides, I've got one answer per line just going down so that as you go through, you can check your work. If you see, oh, wow, I got that one wrong. I get it now. You can like go back and fix the rest of them rather than just giving you all the answers at once. So um, pause the video, go get, to, go get out a sheet of paper, um, some real paper or pencil. By just using a pencil and paper, you'll learn more than if you just sort of think about it and come close but don't quite get it right. Um, there's a lot to be said for how your brain works in manipulating information when you actually have to write it down when you commit. Even if you're just, you know, if you're using a text editor or something, open up Vim and write down what you think the conditions for these flags need to be. Um, I actually had the answer in last, uh, the, um, yeah, in Monday's lecture. So you've already seen the answers. Um, but if you can work through this and do this on your own and it matches what you got, what we got in, in lecture on Monday, that's fabulous. That's the place we want to get to. And these kinds of things, there's practice problems in the book. They make great exam questions. Those will be similar to the practice problems in the book. I'll show you an example of one of those from the quiz on Monday. All right, but here's the idea. Okay, so I'm going to start just clicking through and revealing one answer at a time, and maybe making a brief comment, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail to explain it. Uh, if there's any one of these that you want me to spend more time on, throw a question up on Piazza and maybe I'll put another little review segment in talking about one more of these as we get closer to that quiz or exam. Or if there's a, some, something that comes up when we're actually looking at code, why the compiler made a certain decision as to what to use, then uh, we can talk about that. All right, so here we go. So first the jump condition, uh, yep, uh, requires no flags to be set whatsoever. This is automatic, unconditional jump. All right, the jump of equal to, remember I'm gonna be doing subtraction here, 
So if I, if I have something equal to something else and I subtract, then the answer has to be zero. And so the zero flag will be the one that's set. If they're not equal to each other, then I need the not zero flag. So if the zero flag is set to one right here for equal, uh, for not equal, it just needs to be the complement of that. So that's going to flip this from zero to one, and then uh, that condition will be true. Okay, so next up, the less than or equal to, this is actually pretty straightforward. I'm just going to start with the less than condition and throw on and or, it was or, uh, equal to, which is the zero flag. So this condition right here just got moved right there. Okay, jump greater than. Yeah, once we have this less than, this is also pretty straightforward. It's just going to be the reverse of that. If it's less than, um, to be greater than, it's just going to be uh, flip that around. And then same deal with the greater than or equal to. Uh, we just tack on the or equal to. All right, cool. Now these next four, these are all going to be related for, so these are the ones for, um, for unsigned integers. So here we're going to be looking at the uh, carry flag instead of the sign flag and the overflow flag. So if something is below, all right, that means I've taken a number and subtracted a bigger number. In order to do that, I needed to borrow because we're looking at subtraction. That's the carry flag. So all I need to do is decide if the carry flag is set or not when I do that subtraction. All right, below or equal to, same deal as up here when I added on the or equal to, uh, carry flag or equal. If it's above, then that's going to be, I did some subtraction um, and decided that the carry flag was not set and it's not equal to zero to be above. All right, and if it's uh, above or equal to, then it's just going to be the carry flag. All right. So next up, let me go put together another example of um, the next topic, and I'll be right back. All right, so next up, I want to move into loops and just do a little bit more here. And the first idea is uh, transforming one kind of loop into another. These are actually really common problems given to students in like their first semester programming. So I think you guys probably have already seen this stuff, but I want to take it two more levels, not just one more level, but two more levels. We're going to go into go to loops and then assembly based loops. But let's just start with the basics. So in C, we've got three styles of loops. We have for loops, while loops, and do while loops. So, and I've just got sort of the basic syntax outlined here. Um, I'm just gonna jump into this. You've seen these before. All right, so if I were to take an example for loop, here I've um, got my initialization block, my condition block, my post block, post expression, the body of the loop, and transform this from a for loop into a while loop. What I need to do is take my initialization statement and just move that uh, to in front of the while loop. And I get one statement in a for loop um, that can be comma separated so I can initialize more than one variable, but they all have to be of the same type. So I can just do that up here in front of my loop uh, if I'm turning this into a while loop. My condition here just gets copied directly into the condition block of the while loop. And the post increment gets put at the bottom, or I guess the post expression, in this case I'm an increment, gets just copied into the very bottom of the while loop. So when it goes through a for loop, it initializes some variables, it does the body of the loop, no, wait, it initializes the variables, it does the test to make sure that we want to do the loop, it does the loop, then it does the post expression, then comes back and does the condition again. So that's what we're doing here. We initialize some stuff, we check the condition to see if we want to go through the loop, we do it, we do whatever we want, sum plus equals i, we do the post expression, in this case I'm incrementing, then we go back up and test the condition again. Okay, so pretty simple transformation. I just need to move some of these pieces around. This piece goes here, this piece goes here, this piece goes here, body of the loop goes there. Okay, I can do the same thing with a do while loop. The only difference between while and do while is that a do while loop is guaranteed to do the body of the loop at least once. Now for something like a force loop or a while loop, they're, they're not guaranteed to do that. So in order to use a do while loop structure and still actually do this same computation, I may not want to do the loop at all. So I'm just gonna put the entire do while loop inside of an if statement. So the very first thing I'm doing, I'm just gonna duplicate that condition, stick it right there. And then this is the same. I've got my sum, I've got my increment, and then the while conditional block moves to the end. 
in a do while statement. There's, there's a bunch of different ways that we could have implemented this transformation. This is just one that sort of jumped out and made sense to me, thinking about, you know, I may not want to do the body of the loop once, so I'll just put it in a condition. And we're going to see, you know, I guess part of the reason I'm spending some time on this is that when we go and look at what the compiler does and generates assembly code, it has lots of different ways that it can translate different loop structures into assembly code. And it makes some decisions that I think, wow, that looks weird. I wonder why they chose to do it that way. So I wanted to just spend a little bit of time here and talk about some of the ways that these things are done. And let's actually uh, take a look at the go to loop transformations. So assembly doesn't have a for statement. There is no while statement. There's no do. What we do have is a jump. We've got uh, condition based jump statements. OK, so the closest thing we actually have to that in C is a go to statement. This is just going to um, transfer control of flow to some statement inside of C. So this is perfectly valid C syntax right here. I've rewritten the for loop without using the word for. So here I've got my um, initialization statement and then uh, I've put a label here. We'll come back to that in a second. My condition. So right here, I've got a condition to decide if I want to execute the body of the loop or not. I've got that here as an if statement now. My body of the loop comes next. My increment statement after that. And finally, I'm going to wrap up with a should I have done this loop, then I might want to do it again. So in that case, I'm going to jump back up to right before the condition. And all this go to does is it's going to redirect the control of flow up to wherever that label statement is. So this is how you declare a label in C. It's just uh, any word that's a valid uh, variable name followed by a colon. They'll almost always be capitalized in any code that I ever write, and that's a pretty common convention. Um, they end in a colon. The uh, compiler will create its own labels and almost always label them L2, L3, L4. L stands for label. Um, so I'm using that convention here. And then this structure permits us to duplicate the same function as this one up here, but without using the word for. All right, I can do the same thing again with the while loop. So here I've created a while loop uh, where I've not used the word while. It's basically the same code we just saw. So I've got my initialization. Um, I've got a, a label that I'm going to jump back to. I've got my condition. So in this case, instead of using the while, I'm using an if. And then the pieces, my body of the loop go here my increment block, and then jump back up to evaluate the condition again. Same kind of thing here also. Um, and it's it's the same thing for the do while version. It's uh, I just copied and pasted this, uh, the red code for the go to version. Anyway, you can pause the video and stare at that if you want for a second, but I'm going to move on. OK, so the next transformation, this is level two of my transformation, is uh, we're going to be looking at taking loops and turning them into assembly code. And this is what the compiler is going to do. Uh, we're, you know, we're going to write a couple pieces just to make sure we understand. But most of what we're going to be doing is looking at code that the compiler has created for us. And the compiler, at least in my experience, is a big fan of do while loops. So it's going to transform a lot of stuff that I would not have done into do while loops and then display them kind of like this. And that's because a do while loop in assembly is just very easy. Um, so I've got my statements here inside the body of the loop. They're going to execute at least once. So I'm going to start reading this with my add line. I'm going to add the contents of register EAX to EBX and store it there. So in this case, EBX is going to be the sum and EAX is going to hold my counter variable I. All right. So I just do the body of the loop. I do my increment inc with uh, my variable uh, i is stored in uh, eax register this time and then i need to compute the condition so i'm just going to compare uh, i to the number five here dollar sign means this is an immediate value so basically this is just going to take um let's see well, how does that work i minus five and uh, yep i minus five and then compute the condition registers and if that's true um, if i is less than 5, then we do want to jump back up and do the loop again. So, um, yes. Yep, that's right. Jump less than. And then this will just go through the loop until we get to the point where uh, 5 minus i is uh, less than 0. And then it will stop. Or equal to 0. Because it's jump less than only. 
Okay, so this is very simple. All I needed to do was add a label, I keep straight line uh, code versions of things, and a jump lesson at the end. So the do while loop is very easy for assembly to handle. So as the compiler goes through, it enjoys transforming things into this same kind of structure. And so as an example of something that I thought was just weird when I was looking at it in code, reading the assembly is something like a while loop. You know, I use these all the time when I write code, but what assembly is going to do, or the compiler is going to do when it turns this into assembly, as the very first step, um, maybe just compare straight across. So I've still got my label, I've got my addition, I've got my increment, I've added an extra label, I've got the compare and the jump. The very first thing it does, so is I've retained most of this structure from the do while version, but instead, first thing I'm going to do is actually jump down to the very end. So we go to L4 and do the comparison first. And that's the first thing that happens in a while loop. It's just that I've put this comparison statement at the very end of this structure. So I've got two pieces here. I've got the compare and then I've got a jump. So it's basically duplicating the do while version with the comparison at the end, but just adding on this unconditional jump at the very first. So first thing it does is it jumps to this test. Then I compare 5 to i. If uh, it's less than, then I'm going to jump up and do the body of the loop. And from here, it's just like just like normal. Um, so I'm going to increment. Uh, or I'm going to yeah, I'm going to add to the, my sum. I'm going to increment i, and then uh, skip the label. And here I'm going to compare again. And if I want to go through the loop again, then I'm going to jump back up to L2 and do the loop. Compare jump to L2, do the loop. So all, every time through the while loop, I go through this. Okay, so the piece I wanted to highlight, the difference here is that I've copied pretty much the entire do while structure straight over for the while one, and then added a jump as the very first statement to the condition which is at the end. Next up, I'm going to go pull up some code uh, on a CSL machine. We'll take a look at the assembly version and the code uh, C code side by side and just sort of walk through a couple more examples with some some like real examples. All right, let me go set that up. I'll be right back. All right, guys, I just jumped over onto a CSL machine. I'm looking at some code. Go download the material in the code section off of Canvas and you can follow along with me. Um, so I've just got a very simple function here defined in uh, if else.c. Um, basically, it's going to declare two variables, a and b, and then I'm going to do a comparison. And if A is greater than B, we'll assign A to, and in fact, I'm going to make a real quick change right here um, and replace that 0 with a 3 and that 0 with a 4. That way, it'll be easier to spot those numbers in the uh, assembly code so we can sort of figure out what's going on because this is going to get turned into uh, about 60 lines of assembly code in just a second. So pretty straightforward, uh, just in F else, we're just doing some variable assignment. Um, Technically, I don't need a main function to compile. It'll still compile, it'll still produce assembly code, it's not going to give me any errors. And to do that, uh, GCC, I need the dash S option. This will automatically create the uh, the assembly code, the dot S file. So all I need to do is compile if else dot C, turn on all the warnings, and for M32 architecture. Okay, that looks like it worked. Um, Yep, there it is, if else.s. So next I want to do is I'm going to open these up side by side. If you're using Vim, you've actually got a couple of options. My favorite is to just do it from the command line. Dash capital O is going to be opening multiple files. And then I want if else.star for the wildcard. So this will open all files with that prefix if I didn't screw up. And there we go. So now we can see side by side the original C code and the assembly code that this is generated. So check this out. Just looking here, I've got about, yeah, 64 lines that this got turned into. So I wanted a, like a real quick way to be able to figure out where this function is starting. There's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, we'll go into later, but I want to just focus on this piece of it, the actual code for right now. So I'm going to look for somewhere where I'm assigning the number one to something. And we'll start that. So this number one is going to be a dollar sign one somewhere in this code and it's right here on line 17. So right here we've got uh, an immediate value of 1 and we're assigning that to a location in memory. So it looks like uh, the register here contains a memory address and we're offsetting by 8 uh, bytes from that. 
let me just see back where do we have EBP stored so EBP is originally given the value of the stack pointer so that's great the function is being stored the, the local variables for the function are being stored on the stack so I've got my stack pointer I move eight bytes away from where that pointer is so that's gonna be the location where this memory um, in this case the variable a is and then the second thing we do we're moving two. that's the value of B into a memory location four bytes away from the stack pointer so that's great integers are both four bytes so that kind of makes sense those two look good to me all right the next thing we do I've got those two guys in memory now on the stack um, I need to do that comparison right here a greater than B so in order to do that I need at least one of those pieces of data to be in a register so that's what I'm gonna do now is move in this case this first one here was a so I'm gonna move that it's the number one stored on the stack into variable I'm sorry into the register EIX and then because the comparison also requires at least one thing be in a register I can still use the memory address here but they just can't both be memory addresses so the, the four bytes away from that stack pointer stored in EBP is the two for my variable B right there I'm just gonna do that comparison so this is going to compute uh, the subtraction. Let's see, it's going to take um, B minus A, A minus B, which, wait, wait. So this was, uh, this is always confusing the way that it switches around. Uh, some people just think naturally this way. I'm not one of them. Okay, so this was B. It's doing A minus B, A minus B, yep. And then over here, A minus B, if it's greater than zero, we want to do this. If it's less, we want to jump. So, yep, oh, less than or equal to. So that's the very next instruction, jump less than or equal. All right, let me say that one more time just to make sure if I screwed up, I get it right at least once, hopefully twice. So I'm going to be comparing four units off. That was B. And because this is in the first position, I'm going to be subtracting that from EAX. So I'm going to take A, subtract B, and then check to see if that's uh, zero or overflowed. So if A is greater than B, I want to do this. I want to jump if it's not. So jump would be less than or equal to. So jump less than or equal to and move to position L2. Okay, so if it's true, we don't jump. And then I'm going to be storing three in A. And A was the one that's eight units off the stack pointer. So eight bytes, that's this memory address right here. And then once we finish this, we don't want to execute the else blocks. We just jump straight to the end, L4, down here. Okay, and then after that, if we did take this jump, then we want to do the else block. So we should be moving an immediate four into the memory address where we're storing the variable B. So oh, one thing I want to point out too is nowhere in here am I keeping track of the fact that I labeled these A and B anywhere in this code. I'm only just using memory addresses at this point. So once the compiler has gotten through and created the assembly code, it no longer needs to keep track of that symbol table, but we're keeping track of you know what the programmer called the variables. It's now only using memory addresses. All right, so I hope, I hope this was good. We can see how um, you know the big picture, everything that's going on inside of uh, uh, even a very small segment of code so let's see here, these one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code got turned into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, looks like 10 lines of assembly right there. We're able to find it using uh, like a, an immediate value that we could just uh, immediately recognize. Um, if you're if you're using that as like a clue to find something in a larger piece of code, if you're searching for dollar sign something, avoid things that are multiples of four as your like clues because Here's a 16 as an immediate, uh, frequently used to increment the stack pointer, move things around. So four, eight, 16, not good choices. But if you're just looking for a little signal, you can set something to uh, uh, just assign a variable. It'll get recorded here and you can like search for that. All right, um, I'm gonna pause, pull up my next example and I'll be right back. This is just a simple factorial function, not the recursive version, just the one that uses the while loop. So I'm going to be declaring a fact variable and um, just accumulating the, the computation factorial. That's like five, five, five factorials, five times four times three times two times one, that one. So function is going to take a parameter n. If n is greater than one, 
then I'm just going to compute factorial um, times equal n. So if, like if I give it a 5, it'll take my 1 times 5, and I get 5. Then it's going to decrement n. Next time through the loop, it'll be 4, so I'll have that 5 times 4. Next time through the loop, it'll be a 3, so 5 times 4 times 3. Uh, we get all the way done when um, we're down to n is equal to 1. No longer does that computation. just returns the uh, result of that computation. Okay, so now I've already gone ahead and put this into... Um, I ran the compiler with the dash s option to create the assembly code. The other way to pull something up in Vim, if you're a Vim user, is with the vertical split. I'm pretty sure it's vs, it's not split vertical sv. I think it's this one. Um, and then I just need the name of the other file. So that's factorial, and I want the s. Yep, okay, that worked. So now I've got both files here side by side. I'm going to do the same trick again to see if I can figure out where this is. My very first line of code here, I'm storing the number one in a variable. So I'm just going to scan through the code and find that dollar sign one. Let's see here. I, I've got a couple of places where I've got dollar sign ones. The one I'm looking though, and there's one right here. I also see one right there. That's a subtraction. That'll be from my decrement line. And I've got another one right here in the comparison. That's from that one. Okay, so the interesting one that line two here, declare the integer variable fact, store one in it, is this one right here. So I'm moving the immediate value one into a memory location. I'm using, uh, it's, uh, let me see if I can spot this here. Yep. So it's based on this, it's based on where the stack pointer is located. I've moved the stack pointer into this register. And then this is an offset from where that pointer is. So this is just a memory location on the stack, which is perfect for a function. Okay, now, um, part of the reason I just spent like 10 minutes going through those slides and talked about transformations of loops, if I were going to write this like a, a normal human, the first thing I would do is that would be a condition. I would be evaluating something and then trying to decide if I want to execute the loop or not. But that's not what the compiler has done here. So first thing I do here, I store the one in some memory location, and then I jump. And where do I jump? Down here right there to the bottom of the loop. And this is where I'm actually doing my comparison. So this actually has the same structure that we would see in a do while loop. They put their comparison at the bottom, they jump all the way down to it. So the statements that we're looking at in the assembly don't come out in the same order. It's up to the compiler to decide how it's gonna go through and do things. So let me just walk through what they're really doing here. It does have that do while structure. So the first thing we do, we store the value, we jump to the bottom, and then we're going to do the comparison. This is, is n greater than 1. So I'm comparing the immediate value to a different memory location. So that first one was minus 4 from whatever address is stored in EBP. And this one is 8 in the other direction uh, from EBP. So this is going to be uh, my input parameter n. Um, that's going to be stored right there. I compare to 1, and then if it's greater than, yep, yeah, because this is going to subtract the n, take, take 1 away from n, see if it's greater than 0, so greater than. If it is, we want to do this loop. So now it's going to jump back up to the contents of the loop. This would be the body of the do part if this were had, in fact, been transformed to the do while loop structure. So what we're looking at here is we're going to move um, a memory address into a register. So before I can do any of this computation, in this case, it's going to be a multiplication. Right now, all the data is in memory. I need to put some of it into a register. I can't do any operation that has two memory addresses. So this is just grab some data, and this minus 4 is the value of fact. Store that in a register. And then I'm going to be multiplying my value of n by the value of fact and storing it back in fact, Okay, which is the EAX register. Then I'm going to be storing EAX um into this memory location so that's going to be yep now it's taking the uh the result of this computation and putting it back in memory it's not just going to leave it in a register and finally we're going to subtract one that's the decrement from the parameter pat that we passed in n okay after we've decremented n we need to go back and check this condition again and we're already right there skip the label we do the comparison one compare one to the value of n which is stored eight above the 
the memory address uh, stored in EP, EBP. And if it's greater than we jump, we do the loop again. All right, so I hope this was uh, kind of useful to just see, you know, clues as to how to, to wade through. I mean, this is, what do we got again? 63 lines of challenging to read, you know, but possible to read code to figure out where each line is and just kind of walk through a small piece of it. All right, I'm only gonna do two examples. The book has a large number of examples of all the different kinds of loops and structures. Um, what I want you guys to do is to come up with your own example, challenge yourself, and but keep it small. You know, don't make it more than like 10 lines of code. Feel free to see what happens if you put this in a main function. Um, I, uh, I really like, I, I chose to do it this way because the compiler has some built-in optimizations that it's capable of doing. I don't believe we've turned any of them on at this point, but if it knows that you're trying to compute a factorial of a small enough number, it may choose not to do this in a loop and may in fact just say, well, there's only like factorial three is small. All I need to do is compute three times two. It may choose to do something very different and like unwind the loop or to choose a different structure uh, for the loop. Um, as opposed to the do while format that it shows here. So uh, experiment with that a little bit and see if you can trace through what's really going on. There's a number of really great examples in the textbook. I, in fact, this is from the textbook. I just, I picked two that I thought would be good to like as introductions. The next thing I want you guys to do is take this a little bit beyond where I'm at, go through the book, find those examples, maybe do a for loop, maybe actually do a do while loop, maybe do something that's got a go to statement in it. And just play around with some of these, like, you know, the structures you learned during the first three weeks of Java 1. And see what the compiler is actually doing if you put them in and take a look at the assembly code. Just really small pieces. Um, this is the, the guided learning opportunity. I want to give you guys just some time to play. If this were in a classroom, I would make everybody pull out their laptop and do something. And then we talk about somebody's example. Um, so go ahead. If you get something that comes up to be... Uh, Kind of cool or different or something you didn't expect to see put that on piazza and we'll, we'll take a look at it maybe i'll break down some of these in a future lecture um if we get some good ones all right um let me uh all right i'm gonna stop uh, pause the recording and jump into uh the next piece which is uh accessing the condition code register let me go make a slide for that one sec all right so i've been talking about how the condition code register or the e-flags register is hidden we can't actually go and access this directly and um, set the register. It's always set by a result of the uh, some computation as a system of flags to indicate what's happened as a result of that computation or comparison. But we do have access to set instructions that can extract a single byte um, from, actually it's a, it's a register just of bits. It's gonna take one bit of those and set a byte to either zero or one. Um, and the set instructions we have are basically the same options as the jump instructions. So we've got a set if it's equal to, set if not equal to, and this is going to use a combination of those bits. So we're not accessing them directly um, in most cases, but we also have uh, then for the assigned integers, we've got set less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal, set above, above and equal, below, below and equal. So we've got all those options. It's going to take a combination of the, you know, the, the uh, overflow flag and the sign flag and do that computation. So let me just do an example. Um, yeah, here we go. So if we take a look at the set L, the so set less than, I'm going to do a quick computation. I'm going to assume that I've got a, a register containing the immediate value one and another register containing the immediate value two. I'll do the subtraction. Um, a minus B, so in this case, A minus B. So one take away two is minus one. So this is gonna do that computation and set the flags. All right, uh, the result when I take one and subtract two from it's negative one. So that means the sign flag will be set because it's negative. The overflow flag will not be set because uh, we've got a 32-bit uh, machine here and it can easily hold these values. It's not gonna wrap around. And so when I do the exclusive or and look at are they both different? That's going to be true, and I get a 1. So in this case, uh, this would be uh, indicative of saying that 1 is, in fact, less than 2. So when I go ahead and use the set L, uh, or jump less than, or whatever, that's going to give me the same. This is the same set of 
that same result, this, this one right here, the result of this exclusive or computation is what's going to be extracted when I do set L. And I need to give it a place to put it. It needs to go in an entire byte, even though this is only one bit. It's either going to be zero or one. So if I'm setting it in the low order bits of the A register, here's uh, my A register. EAX is the full extended thing. I've got 16 high order bits. Right there, I put dots in because it doesn't matter what they are. Uh, this is only setting the bottom eight. And then I've got the AH piece of the register and the AL piece of the register. So this is what gets set. And in this case, this is a one. So I'm setting it with seven zeros and a one. All right. Um, now it's not super useful because I've got all this other stuff that was never overwritten. So the next thing we need to be able to do is extend this from just one byte to the four byte long data type. Okay, to make it actually useful to to use for computations and things. Okay, so the command there, there's a variety of these also. Um, move commands, the B here and the L stands for byte to long. I'm extending this, uh, this number, basically copying it um, and then filling in the rest of it with either zeros. So the, the Z stands for zero extension or for assigned things. I may wish to use sign extension. In that case, they would have an S. So commands of this form. Um, the book goes into a lot more detail about this. But uh, if I do this here, let me compress this down so I've got all the information on one slide, it still fits. Here's what the command would actually look like. I've got a source, the low order bits of the A register, the destination, the entire extended B register. And if I'm using zero extension, it's going to take all the rest of these bits and just fill them in with zeros and then retain whatever is in AL or the eight low order bits. Okay, so the point here, it's possible to get out the uh, pieces of the condition code register. Um, we can just go ahead and use the set uh, command to grab those, followed by move to make them fit in the entire register. Um, I'm trying to remember an instance where I've actually used this myself and I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, I just want to mention that it is possible. All right, so next up, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to dive a little more deeply into the stack in preparation for talking about function calls. Let me go make some slides for that. All right, so last topic for today, I'm going to spend a little bit of time and talk about the stack pointer. So just a quick review of the memory address space. So I've got the complete picture of the memory available to the program. And the computer does a lot of things to hide what's going on in hardware so that every program actually looks as though it has access to all of the memory, even though your computer might be running more than one thing at a time. Hardware takes care of that and just creates this illusion for the program. So what it looks like from the point of view of a program is a continuous address space from zero all the way up to some maximum value. And it's broken down into a number of pieces. There's some reserved, reserved addresses up at the top. Then there's sections for the code, um, global variables and data, a section for the heap for dynamically allocated pieces of memory. And then at the very opposite end of that, the high numbers is the stack. And this is where we're going to be looking at local variables for functions. Um, and as we uh, introduce function calls, we'll add more and more frames to the stack. Just a couple things to note. Um, I've drawn it so that the zero address is at the top and the numbers get bigger down to the bottom. There's some pictures in our textbook where they have reversed the order of that and they're looking at the picture upside down. And I think this is actually one of the very confusing things about this is the stack is going to be growing from bigger numbers to smaller numbers. And so to grow the stack, the stack pointer, here, let me, let me click the next slide and take a look at this. Yep, so we have a, a stack pointer that points to the very top of the stack, and it just, it's going to take note of that memory address. So whatever the last local variable assigned in main, it's going to be in that address right there. This address is occupied. It's got data in there. It's pointed to that topmost piece of main, the topmost byte. Um, and then as we add, if, if main were to call a function, so I'm going to use foo as my name of a generic function when I don't have anything better to name it. Um, it's going to reserve some more space on the stack. It's going to store a bunch of stuff. There might be some parameters, some local variables. Um, and my stack pointer is now going to point to the very top of the stack frame for foo. So the old value was 84, the new value 48. So we've, uh, we're looking at a smaller number. 48 is less than 84. All right. Um, this is one of the things that's uh, 
endlessly confusing to me. I, I, I switch words all the time. I make mistakes all the time. And this is just one of those places where I get tripped up. So one more example. If I have foo call yet another function, bar, uh, this is going to be at an even lower address. The stack pointer decreases because it's going up towards smaller numbers. And again, the book is flipping this table upside down, the picture when I do it. Um, so don't let that confuse you. Um, if you need to, draw your own picture as you go through this stuff. Um, and then, But I want to answer one more question here. What happens if I personally want to write some assembly code and push some data onto the stack? So here's what I'm going to do. Um, there is a command push L that's going to push uh, four bytes worth. So the L there is for long. So it's going to give me four bytes worth of data. I'm just going to push an immediate value into that data right now. This works just fine. But what's going on inside, if I wanted to break this down, um, is that the first thing I'm going to do is subtract four bytes from my stack pointer. It had been FF28 pointed to the top of the bar. Now I'm going to move that up four bytes. So it's going to be four bytes less. So I can either add a negative four or I can subtract positive four. They both do the same thing. Um, the compiler, I believe, typically chooses subtract. Um, no guarantees. It's got options. They both work the same. And now this is going to give me four bytes of memory I can use that are unallocated. Right now, whatever garbage is in here from the last time I used this memory is still there. I haven't changed anything. So to take advantage of that, if I want to put the number 10 in there, I now have to move the immediate value 10 into the address um, stored in the stack pointer. So that's where the parentheses are. I'm accessing memory every time I use parentheses. And I'm getting that address from the stack pointer. So this is just going to push that value into the stack. So there's four bytes here. They hold the number 10. All right. Conversely, or when I'm done with that, uh, if I want to pop that data right off the stack, uh, there's a command pop L. It's going to grab four bytes off the stack and put them wherever I've got here. But what's going on under the hood with that stack pointer, is the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to access the data at the stack pointer. So the stack pointer is pointed to real legitimate data. Um, some some um, versions of stacks will have like a pointer. Like if you're Im implementing a stack in your own data, you may have it point to one address past where the stack ends, you know, where the new stuff will go. Not the case here. This is pointed to real data um, in address 24. I've got the number 10. It's going to just go ahead and move that number. And here again, I'm accessing memory with the parentheses the data stored in the stack pointer, I'm just going to stick it in a register, EBX. Okay, so that makes a copy on the CPU. The 10 stays there, but the next thing I'm going to do to recover that memory is just add 4 to the stack pointer and just move that pointer down. I'm not going to bother changing this memory. If bar calls another function, it'll just overwrite it. We'll use that memory. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're never going to access that again. And if we did, it was a mistake. Okay, so by just adding 4, that's going to increase this. That's going to actually decrease the size of the stack um, and sort of re uh, reallocate that memory, uh, re reclaim the memory that we had been using to store the 10 in. All right. So I think that's just sort of the briefest introduction to the stack pointer. Uh, I ran out of time. I'm not going to be able to pull off load effective address today. So read about it in the book. Um, it's uh, very similar to all of the memory instructions we've been using with move. It just uh, stores the result of that computation. It stores the address instead of the actual looking up in memory where that move is. Um, you'll find the compiler frequently uses it to do simple arithmetic, which is kind of weird. Um, so if you see that in the code, if you're reading the assembly code generated by something you've uh, written, and it's got an LEA um, L in there, there's only one variant. It's, it's only got the L. It doesn't have the load, load effective address B or load effective address W. It's always the L. Um, sorry, I didn't get a chance to talk more about that. Maybe we'll see some examples as the things come up. Um, but I'm going to go edit this video, put it together, get it out on YouTube, and then start right away on the next one. Um, have a great day, guys. I'll see you tomorrow.